Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Stefan. I'm a freelance developer based in Berlin. Um, I work in comparison tools with companies worldwide, mostly small and mid-sized companies. And today I want to talk about ARCH32, the JITLINK backend. JITLINK is a project that's part of Execution Engine and it aims to replace runtime DYLD. It, this talk will not so, be so much about JITLINK itself and its architecture, but more like the target-specific complexities and mitigations we uh, choose. Um, there's basically three parts of the presentation. One is uh, how do we work with small embedded devices uh, with LVM. Uh, second is uh, the architecture and cons considerations in the initial patch for the JITLINK backend. And the third part is a practical development workflow that we could use for iterating based on this initial patch. In case you want to know more about uh, like the general architecture and usable usage of JITLINK, I can recommend the talk from Soon Ho Kim from the last US developers meeting. This was about native Windows JITing in LVM, and there is a lot of uh, online documentation if you are interested. Let's get it started. Embedded devices are not really suitable for development, uh, at least not with LVM. If we have a look at the uh, size of the monorepo, it's growing and growing, and I'm always surprised how large it is now. Um, if we build LVM JITLINK, a tool uh, only for ARM, then this will be more than 1,500 build steps, which is way too much for the typical embedded devices to run on device. Uh, even if we only build the executor, this will be almost 300 build steps, and it's at the edge, I would say. Fortunately, we have remote execution in LVM JITLINK, so we can pass this OOP executor connect string to the tool and pass it an IP address and a port and it will look for the executor behind that IP address and port and connect to this thing that would run on the device then. The simple option to build the executor would be to take a stripped fork of LVM, of the LVM project repository, and build this on the device. If you have a Raspberry Pi like this one, this will be possible to do. Um, and this is very straightforward because you can use the host tool chain, uh, the device tool chain directly. Uh, but if you want to do debugging of your JIT code, then it will be a bit more complicator, complicated. Uh, we have remote debugging support in Org V2, and there is an example uh, upstream that I linked here. If you want to know more about how this works with LDB, I can recommend uh, the blog post that is linked here as well. Just uh, Google for GDB JIT Interface 101 and you'll find a lot more detail on that. Um, there is one problem with LDB. Just, just as a note, you probably can use GDB and it will work out of the box. If you use, want to use LDB, there is this issue that it lacked ARCH32 relocation support uh, in the latest version. This means that it cannot resolve relocations in debug sections of the object that it gets from the executor. And I fixed this on mainline recently. Uh, in order to use that, you have to build your own uh, LDB from mainline. And basically, you can use a configuration command like the one I show here and build uh, LVM JITLINK executor and LDB server. Once you have the binaries, you can just uh, copy them to the device and you're ready to go. You can also use the Docker container that I linked here that will should do uh, everything without a big hassle. Once you have the, the uh, executables compiled, you uh, copy them to the device and run LDB server. Uh, here, for example, in platform mode, you pass uh, some ports that you can choose, uh, same for LLVM JITLINK executor. And once they are running, we can connect uh, LLDB on our host to this executor and set a breakpoint. This is here, target execution utils. This is a place in the code that will uh, be just before we call into the JITIT main function. And at this point in time, we already registered the uh, debug information of the JIT code with the debugger, 
so we can, for example, set breakpoints into the code. Once that's done, we can run LVM JITLINK um, and pass it a cross-compiled object, like the demo.o in this case, and we can, and, and this will run the code on the device. And this is uh, how we set a breakpoint in JIT uh, code. We stopped at this target uh, utils, um, target execution utils uh, translation unit, and we set a breakpoint on main, and this is maybe not a very frequent uh, situation that you have many or more than one main function. What we see here with an older version of LDB is that uh, the JIT main uh, function has no um, source locations attached while the main function of the executor itself has source information attached. If we have time in the end, I can show this in a demo. Let's see uh, how fast we're going through. So much for running uh, and debugging on device. Let's go to the uh, architecture and considerations in, in the initial patch. A Arch32 has two instruction set states, arm and thumb. And in order to transition between these states, we need some kind of interworking. We need to tell the processor that there's something uh, that we changed the instruction set. And this is typically encoded in the last bit of a branch target address. This is called the branch uh, thump bit, sorry. And it tells the linker to emit a state changing its instruction. Or better to say, to check that the compiler emitted the right thing for us and change it if necessary. So this means instead of a branch B instruction, we may emit a BX instruction. Or instead of a branch with link instruction, we may emit a BLX instruction. Um, for example, uh, if we have a arm thumb call relocation like this and we get a branch offset like 41 in hex here, um, then we know, okay, we are in thumb, the target is thumb, then we can emit a BL instruction. If we get a branch offset that does not have the least significant bit, bit set, then we have to emit a state changing instruction, which would be BLX in this case. The problem with that is that these offsets are collated from the link graph in JITLINK. And the link graph aims to be target agnostic. So what we don't actually want is symbols to have this uh, last significant bit, least significant bit set. Uh, because the actual code starts, uh, in this case, at 40, whatever uh, instruction set state we are going to. And if we had this thumb bit set in the link graph, this would invalidate some uh, invariance within JITLINK and make problems. So after discussing it a bit, uh, we decided to implement, uh, to add target flags to the link graph for each symbol so that we set the target flag to say, okay, this is a, a thumb symbol and we have to emit the state changing instruction or not. <clears throat> yes, for the big picture, basically in JITLINK, we, we create a link graph for the object file format and target instruction set, which is uh, create link graph from elf object arch 32 here. And this link graph uh, goes into link elf arch 32 later. And the link graph is really the only thing that uh, transports information for us between the two steps. So there is no kind of side channel where we could pass this information otherwise. ARM is a four byte fixed length instruction set, while thumb is a variable size uh, instruction set where the most common instructions are two byte. This leads to a lot more density in uh, code. For example, Linux in 2011, uh, thumb, using thumb produced uh, code size by about 20%. And this is very useful for embedded use cases, uh, but it also makes the instruction encoding very, very complicated, and it, it's full of bit shifts and, and masking to use every little uh, bit um, in memory. And if you look at static linkers like LD, they usually do everything on the fly. They are very 
throughput focused and want to have like maximum performance and maybe not so many abstractions. Um, a Tindinger, of course, is also um, one, wants to have a low latency mostly. Um, but even more important for us is flexibility and the ability to work with um, already encoded things and decode them again and change them. For example, for re-optimizations, we may want to adjust uh, indirection stops later on. So it would be good to have stronger abstractions here to write complex encodings, but also to read them. And one reason we already need that, even if we don't have uh, re-optimizations applied, is that ARCH32 uses rel type relocations to store add-ons, while most of the existing Jitlink backends use rel A type relocations. Rel A would store offset value and add-on in the relocation record, in the relocation section, uh, which is not directly in the code. And rel type relocations would store that add-on in place in the uh, immediate field of the instruction that we want to relocate. So that stores some space uh, of the relocation records, but that saves some space in the relocation records, but the linger must be able to decode the instruction to extract the add-ons. And this happens at a comple complete different time than uh, the fix-up period where we want to write the, result, uh, the relocated values. Um, Again, if you look at LD, it will just do that straightforward and do all the encoding, decoding uh, in, in line. It's not so easy to read, I think. Uh, and the way we manage to do it might be better. Might, it, it's a different compromise. Um, so this is an example of uh, encoding, decoding the thumb call um, immediate value for branch instructions. And as you maybe see, uh, we have a quite a symmetric implementation. It's quite close to the documentation. Uh, it, it's, it's readable and it gives some overview and reusability. It's still not easy to validate if this is correct, but what is quite easy is to write unit tests for that. So in this example, we have a encode decode unit test uh, you ha we have a unit test for the um, thumb call relocation with the decode, encode decode function that takes a value, writes it to the memory location and decodes it back and sees if, if the ex uh, expected value actually comes back. So with that, we can test things like zero values, common values, maximum, minimum, but also we can check that overflow values are not giving back the values that we expect. So we can exactly measure um, that, like for example, the, um, what is that jump with uh, J1, J2 branch extensions uh, would be 25 bits of uh, branch distance and not 23 or 26 or something like that. We can also check that uh, other bits of the encoded values of, of, the, of the memory location are not affected. And this is an interesting property that would, LD would, for example, just all write the whole memory location with whatever it thinks it right, it is right and not care about what was there before in many cases. Um, so the architecture here supports uh, to only write the bits that we actually care about. For that, uh, there is a structure called fix-up info for each add kind, and it, it holds all these magic values for the relocation type. Uh, one of them that we care about here is the immediate mask. Um, and we can use that to implement things like write immediate here, uh, this function in a generic way. Um, it takes the immediate mask from the fix up info and checks that the value we get does actually fit into this mask. And we don't uh, write anything outside the immediate field. So that means the encoding matches the instruction. Um, and then it writes only the bits that we really care about and leaves everything else intact. The same we can do for uh, registers, operation, like opcodes and other things. Um, so in the end, we would call this write immediate, like you see here in the last line, um, call it for thumb call. This is the internal edge kind that uh, Jitlink uses and pass it the value that we encoded for the relocated value. 
Indirection stops is another topic. Uh, they are used in JITLink backends all over the place to mimic RPLT and extend branch ranges. These are all complete topics on their own. I cannot go into the details here today. Basically, um, we have a short sequence of linker generated code, which is based on a template like you see here for x86-64. And uh, this will be like a jump that forwards our uh, indirection to the actual location. And it's a 64-bit value that we can insert here. Um, basically, the original relocation would then be resolved to this jump stop in memory. And with ARH32, we don't only have one kind of indirection for the target architecture, but we have many. We have many flavors that depend on uh, the usage of the stop. Like, is it only a interworking stop that uh, transfers instruction set state from arm to thumb or the other way around? Or is it a prompt ex extension stop? Uh, is it absolute or independent? Uh, which target sub architecture does it uh, does it does it need or require? And if you look at LD, uh, it calls these things thunks, not stops. Um, it supports 14 different forms of that only for ARCH32. Right now in JITLink we only have one. Uh, this is basically an example in the initial patch. Um, and we have a stops manager that can be extended for uh, the different flavors that we can have for different architectures. Um, basically, the V7 apps thump stop looks like the one you see here. And it's not so easy as on x86-64. You don't really see where the, like, it's not so easy at least to see where the immediate field goes. Um, but the code is kind of readable, at least. Um, talking about targets, there is a number of sub-architectures for ARH32. Right now, we only implement V7, but I'm happy to review any proposals for other sub-architectures. Uh, V6M would be very interesting for me as well. Um, let's see how, like, if there is any any proposals here, uh, I'm happy to make reviews. If you have uh, an idea, reach out to me and I can help with anything. Um, the many sub-architectures mean that we have varying requirements and um, very detailed uh, configurations that are not part of the target triple. Like all the other um, JITLINK packets basically use the target triple to determine all information about the target. NDNS is there, but other information is not. Um, so I introduced a ARM config uh, structure that is passed through this JITLINK's faces uh, along with the link graph and other information. And this is the place to add target specific, like sub, sub architecture specific configurations like this J1, J2 branch encoding or the stops flavor. This can be extended uh, as you like. Going forward from here, I would say let's iterate. I will try to get this quickly. Uh, there was a proposal for Google Summer of Code this year from Eamon Unai. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, uh, which was a very, who was a very promising student, I think, and who made a great proposal, but there was unfortunately no slot for him. Um, this was a bit disappointing for everyone involved, but we hope to uh, do anything anyway. Um, if you want to go forward with that, uh, the trial and error approach works very well. Take an example that works, um, com cross compile it with Clang, feed it into LVM JITLINK. You don't need to execute it. You can pass this no exec flag and see if it complains. And as long as it doesn't complain, change the code until it does. So, for example, here we have a changed uh, input uh, object and we we'll say, okay, for position independent code, there will be uh, a missing relocation. Uh, you can inspect debug output, which is very, very useful, um, like this. Um, you can find the source location by copying the error message and uh, grab grabbing through the LVM source code. And then you find like this switch statement, for example, and see, okay, the relocation type is not there. I have to edit, uh, edit everywhere where you uh, find a, um, a reference to that, and then do the same again and see what, what JITLINK says, what it complains about. 
You can also change the target and sub-architecture um, and see what, that, what happens here. And if, you're, if you feel lucky, uh, try some C++ input. I will get a lot of, lot of unsupported um, errors. I think we don't have time for a demo, unfortunately. I wanted to show how to inspect working memory and to debug on device. We can do that in the, on the JIT roundtable if anyone is interested. It's today after lunch. Um, let me summarize the learnings that, I, that we would have. Um, we can read the instruction hall for it from working memory. Like what Jitlink does is links everything on the host in working memory and copies that over to the device. And in working memory, we can see, for example, before and after apply fix up that we did actually change the instruction. This is the first example here. And what is also very interesting uh, and very useful is to disassemble for the target instruction set. If you just use the disassemble command in LDB, you get like disassembly for your host, but this is not useful here. You want to disassemble for thumb in this case, you can pass it a whole target triple, but thumb would be enough for the moment. And you see, okay, we have a BL instruction here that has no offset. So it basically uh, branches to itself. Um, and as soon as we do apply fix up, it should have an offset. And so this way you can check you did not break the encoding and everything. Hooray, we have source level debugging. Um, so this is the example for current mainline LDB where we can step through our JIT code on the device, use the typical commands to inspect variables and so on. Um, that's very nice, especially for like bigger code debugging. Uh, if you implement relocations, you probably don't need that. With that, I say thank you for your attention. Uh, we can have a few questions, maybe. Uh, on the last slide here, I listed the... Three minutes for questions. So I guess if anyone wants a question, I can pass the microphone or if you want to come up to the, come up to the microphone. Thanks. One question from, from me. Um, what's the footprint of the, um, the, I guess for want of a better word, a server that runs on the device for this? The, the footprint of the executor? Yes. Um, this is quite large. It's in the, like around one megabyte okay. or maybe more. Yeah. Um, this is okay for hosted embedded devices for bare metal, this is not possible. I built my own project that I uh, showed last year, which is called Easy Clang, and it has a executor implementation that is not compatible with the upstream LVM one, but it is about uh, 2.4 kilobytes. So this is yeah. possible, but it is not something we have upstream. Okay, so you're probably looking at a very high-end Cortex-M possibly, but uh, mostly on the A profile small end. Yeah. Yes, upstream development. I mean. Raspberry Pi is very popular. It, uh, many people have it. It's a good way to implement uh, a first thing here. That might be. Yeah, otherwise you see the uh, past reviews that went into this presentation. Uh, some links I used during the uh, presentation. Thanks uh, for reviews to Lang, Peter, Pavel, and Christoph. And special thanks to Eamon Unai for your GSOC proposal. I'm really sorry that it, it didn't work out. Thank you.